Romans 7. There's one verse here that I want to read to you. Paul the Apostle says, verse 15. He says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Philippians, please, chapter 3. Right after your ribbon, in fact, your ribbon might be at Philippians, <clears throat> your marker. Philippians 3. I would love to preach all of this, but I'm not going to. Uh, that would be another day, another time. But we're just going to jump in at verse 20. <clears throat> For our conversation, stop right there. It's not just talking about your speech conversation. The idea is our life, our behavior, everything we're about, everything we do. Our conversation, look what it says, is in heaven. Somebody say amen. amen. That's our Christian believer down here where we're on the right page and we're doing the right thing. Our lifestyle, our behavior, our desires, what we are, hey, it's all about heaven. We're going there soon. Look what it says. Our conversation is in, in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior. Amen. Praise God. We're all looking for Jesus to come. Amen. 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 Excuse me. Let me give you a chance to say amen. amen. We're all looking for Jesus to come from heaven. The Lord amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. This is what he said. Our life is about. Our conversation is about heaven. And we're looking for our Lord. To come from heaven. Amen. And he is. Verse 21. Jesus who shall change our vile body. That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious yeah. body. Stop just a minute. This mortal will put on immortality. Amen. 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 It's going to happen. I'm going, this body is going to change. And when I see him, I'll be like him. Amen. Hallelujah. It's a glory to God. Amen. But what it says, according, uh, uh, be fashioned like in his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. There's no doubt about it that this is talking about when we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's what this is talking about. One day he's coming back. We're looking for him. He's going to come and he's going to change us. And this corruptible will put on incorruption. I'll be like him. Hallelujah. He's able to subdue all things. Doesn't matter what's going on down here. When he comes back, boom, it's over. Everything will be underneath this uh, Jesus subjection right there. Amen. It's a hallelujah. That's what the verse speaks of. But I do want to make an application of that he's able to subdue all things. Part of that is he's able to subdue all things right now. It's not, an, it's not that he can't do it till he comes back. No, no, no. He can do it right now. Yes, sir. And in fact, he is right now King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He already is. Yeah. I know that God has given license to Satan, and he has some uh, authority, he has some activity that he has power. He does. God gave it to him. But he won't keep it. It's going to be over one day. But right now, I'm saying right now, Jesus is still able at this moment to subdue all things. Unto himself. There is nothing that he doesn't have power to have victory over. Amen. Let me pray and ask God to help me and then that we'll have open hearts. Let's pray. Our great God, I sure love you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for proving that you love me. You're so good to me. You're so good to us. We just want to give you glory and praise. Thank you that you're able to subdue all things right now. 
Lord, uh, we're not going to take time. You already know. We're not going to delve into the passage to prove all of this. But by faith, I believe that we all know, Jesus, you're King of Kings right now. You're Lord of Lords. And I just pray we would yield and surrender to you. And then we will accept, I suppose, accept and receive what you have available for us in this life right now as we traffic in this wicked world. So I ask you to help me communicate, give me power, unction, utterance. I pray you'll be glorified and you get all the glory and all the honor. The Lord will be honest tonight with whatever you speak to us about. So thank you. We praise your name, Jesus. We sure look forward to when we get to see you. It's in your holy name we pray, Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. My favorite preaching is expositional preaching. Just go through the text and show and try to look and see what it says. I'm not doing that tonight. So just bear with me and... By God's grace, he'll speak to us, and we will be benefited tonight. So, uh, a man stood at the podium and said four short, simple words. And he said, don't be like me. His name was Mickey Mantle. He graduated from high school from Oklahoma and he signed with the New York Yankees. He won seven, he was on seven World Series winning teams. He won three most valuable players. He hit 500 home runs. He was enshrined in the Cooperstown Hall of Fame and Mickey Mantle was an alcoholic. At 60 years of age, he was dying of liver cancer. His health eroded from years of alcohol abuse. So he stood at the podium and he said to all the fathers and the sons who had looked up to him for so long, and he said, don't be like me. He was addicted, an alcoholic. So I want to talk about addiction as we move into this. When we think of the addiction, you and I, if we were just sitting around saying, man, you know, this addiction thing, people are having trouble. We generally, we, we have a few things in our brain that pop up automatically. Alcohol is one of them. Drug addiction is one of them. Perhaps some of them would think of gambling. we think of that, and that would come to us. And then because of the opioid thing that's been a crisis, if you're a news watcher over the last several years, we might say painkillers and so on. And I was surprised that in America, the addiction center said that these are the four and they're in order. Tobacco's number one. Alcohol's number two. Marijuana's number three. Painkillers is number four in America. I, I was surprised by that, that those were the order of them. But it doesn't matter. And so addiction. I'm going to read you a couple definitions of addiction. There's several of them, I suppose, but addiction is a term that means compulsive physiological need. That means physically you have a need for and the use of habit forming substance. So I just told you what four of them were. And so you have this physiology, physiological need that you need it. It's characterized by phys physiological symptoms upon withdrawal. So a lot of people say, no, no, I'm not addicted, I'm not addicted. But if they try to withdraw from it, no, they got problems. Amen. It shows up. Hey, yeah, you're addicted. Another definition of addiction would be like this. It... it uh, it, it can refer to, and it's a broad reference to compulsive use. You just can't stop doing it, using it. It encompasses both mental and physical reliance. 
It could be physical, you need it, but it also can be psychological. You, I gotta have this. Addiction to alcohol and other kind of drugs, actually, I'll just say it, any addiction has a physical and emotional connection. But it is first and foremost a spiritual problem. It is physical, it is. It is mental, it is. But it is spiritual. That's what happened that someone gave in to the physical and the mental because they didn't give in to the spirit. Addicts know what it's like to experience the inadequacy of willpower. Yes. They say, I can quit any time. I can stop. I don't have to keep doing this. And all of us can relate to Paul's words. All of us in this room can relate. <clears throat> We've said these words in our own way many times. We said in our own way. Paul said it like this. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. And you might not have said it like that, but most of us in this room have had something in our life that we know we shouldn't. We think we can stop any time. We need more than willpower to overcome the things that hold us in bondage. We tell ourselves, get your act together, come on. Buck up, buddy. Come on, Dave, try harder. We live under the illusion that we are in control. Amen. And we, that we don't need anything. We don't need anybody. I got this. But the truth of the matter is we live in a fallen and sinful world. Sin is a powerful force. One that we cannot defeat on our own. Our flesh wants its own way. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Romans 8, 7. Overcoming physical and emotional addiction involves spiritual conviction. <clears throat> Until we surrender to God and allow Him to bring about transformation, we will remain trapped or stuck. God will not force Himself upon us. He will let us remain stuck until we ask for His help and we surrender. Could take a tragedy. Could take a defibrillator. <coughs> many, many will not look up until they hit bottom. Pain is sometimes God's way of helping us face the truth about ourselves. The suffering finally exposes that we cannot do it on our own. We need some help here. Some of us here may be struggling. With alcohol. Or drugs. Or painkillers. There's a bigger list than that. But the real problem is not that you are powerless over alcohol or drugs or painkillers. The real problem is that you are powerless over self. And sin. It just happens to manifest itself in alcohol, drugs, or painkillers. There are lots of things that we can be addicted to. I don't have a complete list. It might be impossible. But I did make a list. We've already talked about the alcohol, painkillers, tobacco. Here's a 
addictions some people have, sexual immorality. I'll use another word that's included in the, that word is, is pornography. But sexual immorality goes way beyond pornography. Some people are addicted to lust. So now I'm going to say some are addicted to gambling. I'll just go ahead and say some people are addicted to television. Some people are addicted to uh, video games. Internet. Movies. Books. Phone. Caffeine. Ice cream. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Chocolate. Donuts. Yeah. Let's say it. Overeating. Yeah. I don't know if you're getting the word or not, but it's addicted. <clears throat> Overworking. Busyness. Shopping. Guns. Cars. Golf. Sports. Anything with a ball in it. Lying. Lying. <coughs> Gossip. <coughs> Drama. <coughs> Anger. <coughs> Depression. There's a host of others. There's a host of others. But you can become addicted to almost anything. That it's in you. You need it. It helps you. I thought this was fascinating. In the work, in the work. In 2018, there's a graph that shows people that watch TV, how many hours a day? And people that use their phone, how many hours a day? In 2018... And almost connected. In 2018, people were watch TV three hours and 44 minutes a day. They used their phone three hours and 25 minutes a day. 2021, today, three hours and 22 minutes on TV, three hours and 54 minutes on the phone. I don't know if you could add that up. That's seven hours and 16 minutes a day that you, most Americans are doing TV or phone. Although I think this is a, it may be an average because I read it. People look at their phone, they look at their phone, they look at their phone 53 times a day. I think that's low. Yeah. I was at the restaurant the other night, Nancy and I went out, we were up in New York and we went out to eat by ourselves and sat in a nice place. It was a surprise to us, but anyway, that's where we were. And so we're by ourselves and there's, uh, husband wife husband wife and somebody's mother one of their mothers is there they're at a table and they're having a nice meal and somebody they're celebrating something and there was a lady there that before we ordered they were sitting right across from us I, my line of sight was right there she looked at her phone and the, when i was just paying, i didn't count on it but if i thought about this i'd have tried to count it. okay and she went <laughs> but I bet, I bet she looked at it over 39. Wow. We were there for about two hours. It's one of those restaurants that think you're supposed to be there two hours. <laughs> they just won't bring you the food. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they bring you this, and they wait a while, and they bring you something else. We did. It was a surprise. <laughs> 
But maybe you and I ought to watch people someday and mark, make a mark and go, oh, okay. Or maybe someone ought to watch you. What causes the addiction? There are, there are lots of variables and so on, but I'm going to just do this scientific thing that has come up, and now when we say scientific, we all go, whatever. Yeah. If Fauci said it, was that really true? Yeah. And which scientist do we believe? But anyway, there's a study, and it says that one of the things that cause addiction is dopamine. I think it's cool that it, one of the things that cause addiction starts with the word dope. <laughs> dopamine. But dopamine is a neurotransmitter that we have in our brain. It is, it is an <clears throat> enzyme that is produced in the brain. Your nervous system uses it to send messages between nerve cells. And so our, our nervous system all through our body that this no, dopamine is sent from place to place, and listen to it. Dopamine plays a role in how we feel pleasure. Yes. It's a big part of our unique human ability to think and plan. So in our head, when we're thinking about something and we're trying to plan ahead for it, sometimes once the dopamine is released as an enzyme and it's giving us some pleasure that, oh, good, I've got a plan here. I'm looking forward to that. Is everybody with me? It's just a small thing. It's just, but that's a transmitter that it does to get from place to place. It continues. It says, it helps us strive. We're going after a goal. It, it helps us focus. I want to see this. I want to understand. I want to get this. Dopamine, it's moved around in us. It helps us find things interesting. Some things that are not interesting in us and all that, we go, whatever, and we turn it off. But things we're going, oh, oh, I want to, I, I like that. The dopamine is released. It helps us find things we like. And it gives us uh, pleasure. We're like, oh, I do like this. I really like that. Yeah. So it affects parts of our behavior, physical functions. So, like, it affects learning. And, and learning, if the dopamine's not released, we're going, oh, we're glad this is over. Everybody with me? But if you're enjoying it, it affects your learning skill. So, good amount of dopamine help you. If your dopamine's not released, you ain't getting no help from the pleasure. Keep going. Motivation. Why do you do it? I'm motivated to do that. I'm motivated not to do that. It affects your heart rate. It affects blood vessel function. It affects kidney function. It affects how you sleep. It affects your mood. It affects your ability to give attention. Pay attention. It affects pain processing. Dopamine is released when our brain is expecting a reward. When you come to associate a certain activity with pleasure, just the anticipation may be enough to raise dopamine levels. I don't know what you like to do. I hate to use this illustration. This is horrible. But a box of hot Krispy Kreme donuts. Oh, cool. Um, I agree, sister. My dopamine goes, no! I'm serious. I haven't eaten one in, I don't know, months now, but I'm, when I, if the hot sign is on, yes. my car goes, mm. it's automatic. If my family's at Christmas, we all go to Branson and there's a Krispy Kreme there and my family says, uh, hey, Poppy, would you go get everybody some donuts? If I go, I have to buy an extra dozen. Yes. Because I will eat a dozen before I get back to the room. <laughs> I've eaten a dozen Krispy Kreme many times, not once, not twice, many times. 
dozen. The most I've ever eaten in one setting is 16. I've done that two or three times. They're like air. I don't know if you know them. It's like, it's less, it's more like cotton candy. It's not like a marshmallow. You just squeeze it together, and it disappears. You just swallow and you go, oh, dopamine loves you. Just the anticipation can get me happy. Now listen carefully, here we go. And the dopamine could be increased by a certain food expectation or anticipation. It could be increased by the excitement, the joy of getting to go shopping. And you folks know my wife, I don't know how many of you know for certain, but Nancy's spiritual gift is shopping. God gave it to her. I don't know why. But it, her dopamine goes, I'm going shopping. It could be sex. It could be an internet site. It could be a drug. Anybody hear anything I'm saying? The excitement is coming. The Greek philosopher Aristotle 2,000 years ago made this observation. Happiness is the meaning and the purpose of life. The whole aim and end of human existence. Aristotle says humans, the whole reason they're alive, human existence, they want to be happy. And whatever it takes to be happy, Dopamine is released. And I'm telling you, it's probably not far from how us humans behave. Our number one goal is, I just want peace and happiness. Examples of dopamine being released, I just gave you a couple, but another one is gambling addiction. Isn't it weird? The uncontrollable urge to continue gambling Despite the toll that it takes on one's bank account or their family, they just keep doing it. And they know they shouldn't. They know they shouldn't. They know they shouldn't. I can quit anytime. I can't quit anytime. Gambling is addictive because it stimulates the brain's reward system. The same way drugs do. The same way alcohol does. The same way any of our addictions do. In fact, gambling addiction is the most common impulse control disorder worldwide. I just can't control myself. The reward, the what? I say this is why video games are so addictive. Almost every one of us in here that have a smartphone have played in some kind of game on there. And you can't. I'll play one more. And you waste all that time playing the game on there. Well, I'm just resting. It's in between. Mm -hmm. I'm in the doctor's office. I'm waiting. I might as well play a little game. Uh, I say video gaming may be the number two impulse disorder. I'm fearful for our children yeah. and our grandchildren. Yeah. They all got little phones or little pads and they're always playing little games and they go watch, watch, watch. They get immediate satisfaction. And dopamine goes, see there? See there? See there? They go to try to do their homework. They go, this ain't fun. This is not satisfying. Another addiction of dopamine release, sexual addiction. Sex addict. It's characterized by compulsive participation or engagement in any sensual activity. Research has established that compulsive sexual behavior arises from the same, listen to this, it arises from the same transcriptional and epigenetic 
mechanisms that mediate drug addiction. I don't know if you heard it. Sexual addictions come out of the same mediate that drug, drug addiction does. <clears throat> Dopamine. Let me give you another one. Anger addiction. Anger can induce a discharge of dopamine. Another thing, epinephrine. Also referred to as adrenaline. <coughs> the adrenaline rush contributes to a sense of strength and then vulnerability that someone is so mad or so mad and they just go nuts. So if you're wrong, you think, and you become angry, many people hold in the anger and let it build. And then one day, it blows up. And they're invincible. They get to the point where their neurobiology bio is being rewarded when they become angry. Hmm. <coughs> My brother Tim was meth. It causes an intense, elevated, or euphoric mood that is much stronger than cocaine and more addictive. Dr. Karras says, experiencing these unnatural levels of dopamine, euphoria, causes a strong desire to continue using the drug. It becomes addictive because your body experiences intense cravings to maintain a euphoric state. It results in constant redosing and even binge like behavior to achieve that goal. Four stages of addiction. Number one, experimentation. Excuse me, it starts somewhere. I don't know if you heard my brother Tim just mention if you never smoke, you'll never smoke. You never will be addicted to tobacco if you don't smoke. If you don't ever put it in your lip, you'll never be addicted to it. If you never drink, you'll never drink. If you never take the pill, if you never take the shot, if you never, is everybody with me? If you never look at pornography, you won't get hooked on it. The problem is, for us men, I'll just go ahead and admit it, pornography is on, on billboards outside. Amen. It's everywhere. Pornography is walking down the airport in the right. airport, how those ladies are dressed. That's pornography. It's everywhere. And us men need to be honest that we admit that's pornography. We don't need to be looking. Keep our head down. Keep our head adverted. When we see it, turn away. Number two, the stages of addiction experiment. Number two, you start using it regularly in another way you can say to start abusing it. It's, you're just like, I'm okay, I'm okay, it's not that bad. I, mean, you know, I only do it once a week. I don't do it all the time, it's once a month. I'll do it every once in a while. I, you know, I, I'm okay, I'm good. Number three, addiction. You begin to tolerate it. There's a tolerance that happens. You get used to it, and it's not that bad. And now, it doesn't matter which addiction we're talking about. I don't care if we're talking about caffeine or donuts or chocolate or ice cream or pornography. I don't care which one. We kind of get used to it, and we accept it, and it, we're going, well, it's not that bad. I, I didn't eat the whole gallon this time. Let me say half of it. You develop a tolerance to it, and then four Krispy Kremes not enough. Yeah. Sometimes we'll eat six. Yeah. Well, it's just like warm air with sugar on it. Might as well eat 12. <laughs> you know how easy it would be to get addicted to that? McDonald's uh, has a caramel frappuccino and a mocha one. Several years ago, I started drinking coffee and stuff. Anyway, someone introduced me to that. Mercy sakes. One of those a day will help you. <laughs> they taste so good. It's a milkshake coffee. It's awesome. And it's a good price. After about three months of that, I said, I ain't got to quit. This thing's got a hold on me. And I cannot tell you the last time I had one. I don't know how many years. Right. It could be five, eight years. I don't know. But every time I see one, I go, those are really good. 
<laughs> the fourth stage to addiction is addiction. The powerlessness over self and sin is manifested in any addiction you and I might have. I'm going to read them again. Drugs, alcohol, overeating, overworking, busyness, overspending, drama, anger, TV, video games, phones, lust, pornography, any kind of immoral sexual indulgence. To overcome any of these requires spiritual conviction yeah. and a decision to finally yeah. give control over to God. Amen. Surrender Amen. to God. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 5, look at it. The markers there. Verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Come on, folks. That's how we're Christians supposed to walk. Amen? Well, God says, verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We don't have time to waste our life. That's right. That's right. Verse 18, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It's foolish to allow alcohol or anything else to control our life. Let the Spirit of God control you. Amen. If the Spirit of God says eat 18 Krispy Kremes, eat them. <laughs> but he probably won't say that. <laughs> if the Spirit of God says eat the whole quart, eat the whole gallon of ice cream, I'm pretty sure he might not say that. Is anybody hearing me? Amen. I don't care what your addiction is, friend. Anger. Depression. TV, your phone, don't let that control you. I can quit any time. We're not going to turn. Listen carefully. Proverbs 20. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs 23. It describes those who are addicted, dominated, by alcohol. Listen carefully, please. I'm going to read it kind of slow. Luke 20, I mean, Proverbs 23. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contention? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. So the instruction, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. When it's fermented, don't look at it. That's what the Bible says. At the last it biteth like a serpent, it stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, thy heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or he that lieth on the top of the mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say. I was not sick. They have beat me. I felt it not. Watch what he says. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Now that's describing alcohol addiction. And we all think that's true. That's exactly how they act. That's how they behave. It's weird behavior. It's silly behavior. It's, it's, they ought to know better. They do it again. Do it again. They do it again. No, 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 no. They were cracking. I believe that whatever you're addicted to causes you to act stupid. Make decisions that you normally wouldn't make. Go places you wouldn't normally go. See things you normally wouldn't see. Does anybody hear me? Get involved in something you wouldn't normally get involved in. The description, the description is the same. For any addiction we have. So many of us recognize Jesus as our Savior. But we need to take the next step. He's not only our Savior. He's our solution too. Amen. 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 God saved us from sin. And his grace covers our sin. Hallelujah. But God, God's grace also wants to change us into his image. We are to be sanctified. We are to be transformed. We are to be renewing our minds. Somebody say amen. amen. He wants to free us from that which has 
and is destroying us and making us ineffective, making us unproductive in our knowledge and our growing of Christ. Excuse me, I just got to pause here. Just because you came Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, just because you're here tonight, you're in a church service, doesn't mean you don't have some addiction. And any addiction is giving control over something out there instead of the Spirit of God. So how does Jesus become our solution? He died unto sin once. That means he took care of it. Sin is taken care of. Romans 6. He died unto sin once. Then it says in Romans 6. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so we also should walk in newness of life. We can walk in newness of life. Not by our own strength. But in the strength of Christ. He's the solution. Amen. But we have to yield to him. We have to surrender to him. Excuse me, before we can surrender, before we can yield, we've got to admit it. And humble ourselves. Mercy. We have freedom and we have victory in Jesus Christ. But many of us feel enslaved by sin. And so, many of us are stuck. Listen, we're stuck at 1 John 1 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Amen. We waller in that. We don't, I am a sinner and I can't help it. If I say I'm not a sinner, I'm a liar and the truth is not in me. I know I'm a sinner and I'm stuck over here and I can't. Ladies and gentlemen, verse 8 in the Bible, but verse 9 is too. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can be forgiven and cleansed. We don't have to waller in our sin. We are human and we are going to mess up. We are going to sin. We don't have to stay there. Victory is available and we'll confess it. Mercy. As long as we try to fight the problem with our own strength, our own willpower, Jesus says, without me, he can do nothing. I like this statement. I don't know who said it, but Satan can get around our willpower. But he cannot get around Calvary. <laughs> Another part of the solution is we need each other. The wisest man, or the Bible calls him that, he said in Ecclesiastes, two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe unto him that is alone when he falleth. For he hath not another to help him up. Hey, now, be still now. You mean I have to tell somebody you? Sin. You've got to tell God. You have to. But if you've got an addiction, friend, you need some help. Uh, Two is better than one. Well, I'm not telling anybody. You probably will never make it. You think you can do it on your own? Just me and God. I can do it. The Bible says two is better than one. In fact, I'll just give you this. A fellow named Bill Wilson, Dr. John, uh, Dr. Bob Smith, 1935. They started something called AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. Let me give you a piece of trivia. The night they were voting on the name. What are we going to name our group? It, it, it just came out of a, this fellowship in Bridget, but it began to help people. They began to write it down. What are we going to name our group? AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, one by one vote. You know what came in second? The James Club. Because the book of James was their favorite book. It's the one that gave them the most help. And most of the 12 steps come from James. Listen to him. I'm going to read James 1, 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. And afraid of not. And it shall be given him. If you need help, pray and ask God. James 122, 
Be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Just don't find out what it says. Start doing what it says. James 2.17. Even so faith, if it hath not works, it's dead. Oh, I believe, I believe, I believe. No, you've got to do something. James 3.13. Who is, listen to this, who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of the goodness of conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. You got someone that's making it? Let him show the works with meekness. James 4, 6. He giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Somebody say amen. amen. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God. He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's why God wants us to do Do you want to get over this addiction you got? James 4.12. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Watch. Who art thou that judgest? We don't judge each other. The Lord takes care of that. James 5.16. Confess your faults one to another. Oops. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Sounds like we might have the idea of two is better than one. Amen. Amen. God knows the solution to our problems and he is the solution. Can somebody say amen? amen. amen. All right. I want to give you a personal testimony and I want to uh, read you since my brother Tim's prayer. Well, first of all, Tim and I, when he was on drugs, he called me a few times a year and that was it. I tried to call him, and a lot of times he didn't have a phone. He couldn't reach him. But since he's walking in the light, working on that, that's not a surprise that he calls me every day or every two days. Every day. Let's talk about it. So we were talking one day. This is probably two months ago. And I said, wait, wait, wait. I want to write this down. My brother Tim said, Addiction is when you give up everything for one thing. And that one thing cannot satisfy completely. It leaves a hole. We keep trying to fill that hole with the thing that cannot satisfy. Only in recovery do we give up one thing which is addiction for everything, which is God. And he can fill the hole. So just recently, Tim began a new section in his life and what he's doing, and that's enough to say, but here's what Timmy's prayer was, what his prayer is still. He said, God, please open all the doors of my heart that I have kept closed and locked for all these years that I might truly have a relationship with you. Amen. God, I am who you say that I am and not who others say that I am or who I think I am. Thank you. In your holy name, I pray. Amen. We have a brother that's just above Timmy. There's a girl between Timmy and my brother, Joel. 11 years ago, Joel went to celebrate recovery. The reason he went, he asked Timmy and his wife, Brenda, to say, hey, Brett and I, my wife and I, we're going to go to celebrate recovery. If we want to help you, would you be willing to go with us? I go, yeah. We admit, he needs help. We need help. So they went. He went for two months. Tim couldn't take it anymore. He, that's how he's done. So Brenda quit too. But you're not going on. We're not. Joel and Brett kept going. It takes, isn't it 10 months to finish one session? 
They meet every Thursday, every Thursday, every Thursday, every Thursday, every Thursday. They're Thursday, every Thursday. After the first year was over, the pastor asked my brother Joel, said, hey, I want you to be in charge of CR. Joel said, no, I don't need to be. There's already a person in charge. No, God told me you're supposed to be in charge. I want you to be in charge. Okay. So what he started 11 years ago, he was just going to do it so Tim could have a vehicle to get right. And my brother Joel has been in charge of it now for 11 years. He's told me about it lots of times, and he's thankful, and there's all kinds of testimony of blessings, all kinds of testimony of Mark Ray. We pray for Tim. We've all been praying for him. And can we get him to go back to CR? Does he, does he have a desire? Will he do it? Will he do it? And he would act like he would, but then he wouldn't show up. Anyway, i never been to a meeting. I just know Joel and them do it, and I'm glad for him. I'm glad they have a ministry. I'm proud of him, but I'm not part of that. So December, this took you last, so I'd be now nine months ago, ten months ago, my brother Joel came to my daughter's house. We're remodeling the bathroom. He's a carpenter, so we're working. And he goes, hey, Dave, this is on Monday. He said, tomorrow night, uh, Brett, his wife, uh, she's given her testimony at a CR meeting that's close to your house. It's not the one we do, but it's close to your house. Um, if you're interested, you could go. And I go, you know, because... Of what Timmy's been doing, he's been clean back in December. He was clean 27 minus 9, so whatever that is, 18 months or whatever, 16 months, he's been clean. He's been doing good. So I go, hey, this is awesome. 20, I don't know what 27 minus 9, what is that? 18? Okay, 18 months. And I was proud of him. We're thankful. So because Timmy was doing so good, I wanted, I said, I'll go. So Nancy and I went and we heard Brett give her testimony. I'd never been to a CR meeting before. There's 12, 15, 20 people in there. They're scattered around. There's a person up there in front. And they're in charge. They have some songs. They have some songs. And then they go, hey, we have a guest here tonight. Brett McCracken's going to come and give her testimony. I've never heard her talk like this. I just, we talk at Thanksgiving for a couple minutes or Christmas a couple minutes. I don't, I don't know. I just talk to my brother Joel fairly often on the phone once a month or so, but I don't talk to Brett. But I don't know, but they're like, whatever. She gives her testimony. I'm sitting there. All kinds of stuff I hadn't heard before. I was 65 years old, and Brett said something that I've been in the ministry since I was 22 years old. She said, uh, she talked about her addiction. She's addicted to food. She was addicted to, she, and then she said, I was addicted to anger. I've been in the ministry all these years. I've counseled countless people. Lots of people have a lot of anger issues, but I never in my head connected the word addicted with anger <clears throat> until she said it. And God opened the whole floodgate of my heart and mind about addictions at that Amen. moment. Amen. And I was blessed by what God's doing in Brett's life. Thank you. They get done, and the leader gets up there, and the leader does this. So you might need to come and get a blue chip. This is the most important chip. This means you've made a decision to start. You've decided you're going to start. Anybody want to come and get a blue chip? You made a decision that you recognize what your addiction is and you're willing to start. Anybody come and get a blue chip? I'm sitting a little over halfway back. I am under conviction like I would be in a revival <coughs> service with David Harrison preaching. I was torn up, man. I'm thinking, I should go get one of them blue chips. <laughs> but I'm not going to. I'm not part of this. I'm never coming back here again. They'll never see me again. God, you know and I know. I'm, I'll just do it in my heart. I'll start. I knew exactly the addiction. There was no doubt about it. I wrestled with it off and on for years. Thinking, no, I don't have to do it. I don't have to keep going. Is everybody with me? But I was under conviction. So that was Tuesday night and Wednesday morning. Joel comes back to the house. We're working on the bathroom. He goes, hey, tomorrow night, Brenda, Timmy's wife, is giving her testimony for the very first time at our CR meeting. And it's not far from my house. I go, 
You got me coming? So I heard Brenda give her testimony for the first time. And God used him. As I was under conviction, my brother Joel then says, Anybody need to come get a blue chip? Anybody? This is the most important chip. This means you're going to start. You've admitted what it is, you're going to start. Anybody come and get a blue chip? I left my seat and I went down there. I got a blue chip. Right. When you get a blue chip, one of the things they say as a group, it's part of their cadence, but they say, keep coming back. Because you need the help. Two is better than one. Keep coming back. That was December the 10th, 2020. Three weeks later, I'm in California. And my meth head brother calls me. Hey, he said, how you doing? I go, I'm doing great, what's going on? He goes, no, how you doing with your blue chip thing? I said, I'm doing good. Thank you, Lord. And he said, is it harder than you thought it would be? And I said, you know, so far it hasn't been. But I do think about it a lot. Do you know one of the things that's helped me? September the 10th will be nine months. It's the longest I've gone for years. Amen. There's many reasons, but one of the reasons is if my math head brother calls me and says, how you doing? I'm not going to lie to him. I'm just hanging in there, Tim. I'm still making it. Tonight, on the altar up here, the step anyway, the platform, in front of the blue chips. I have no idea what God spoke in your heart about. None. No idea. So since you brought it up, some of you say, okay, Brother Dad, what, what is that addiction thing you got? You want to go? So I'm go. I know you want to know. So I'm going to tell you. It's none of your business. <laughs> Amen. I'm thankful I don't have to confess to everybody. Amen. I do have to confess to him. I need to admit it. You're not going to, you will not start until you admit where you are. And if you've been wrestling, you already know you're there. But you've got to make the decision to start. Timmy and Joel both said, Dave, if you write the date on the back of your chip, you won't ever forget what this is about. Do you know that a lot of us, like, let's just say I've made this nine months if I make it until Thursday, Friday. If I kept going to the meetings, it might be my brother Joel's up there saying, does anybody need to give a blue chip? And there's something else God's brought to my heart and convicted me. I need to go get another one. Is everybody with me? Or if I've fallen off the wagon. No shame coming back. There's no shame. They love to say it's one of their famous sayings. No shame coming back. Yeah. No shame. The whole thing is we're all strugglers. We just want to get right. We want to do the right thing. Tonight, some of you, you get a blue chip. I preached this sermon up in Buffalo, New York last week, Saturday. The pastor and one of my good friends from California that helped get that meeting started was there. I knew the pastor, he stood up in front of all the men and said, I got my blue chip. I didn't know that Sean from California got one, but he showed it to me on Monday. But he got a chip. Neither one of them know, but on my phone it tells me to call them next week and say, how you doing? You know why? Because I want them to make it. And when you have someone that is loving you and praying for you and wants you to make it, 
I ask you to stand with me. Thank you. Let's have prayer. <clears throat> for great God, I come to you again and just want to say hallelujah. Thank you for help. Thank you for people that love other people, want to help them. Thank you for Celebrate Recovery and how my brother and his wife are truly just trying to help people. And then their life has been totally changed. Thank you for how you helped my brother Tim. And their life has totally changed. Thank you. Thank you how you want to help us. I'm just afraid we'd be honest about where we are and who we are. And we know that you are able to subdue all things. No matter what it is, you're able. And we give you glory for that and praise. But have your way with us, Jesus. Our heads are bowed. Anybody needs to come and spend some time at the altar? Get a chip? Amazing God's goodness to us, His kindness. The Lord wants to, and we just have to ask Him. We have to surrender. Like I said, I was under conviction. The Holy Ghost knew it, I knew it. God's so kind. She's going to start playing. Just do what you need to do, folks. You need to shout. You need to sing. You need to pray. You need to hug a neck. You need to thank God. Just do what you need to do. Brother Matt, you have a song you sing to me? I surrender all. I surrender all. If you want to sing with him, you're welcome to. Just whatever God wants you to do. <coughs>